and welcome to a special Christmas edition of Archive Thrifting. And, uh, yeah, you heard me right, Archive Thrifting. Yeah, I know, I'd normally be putting out a new standard archive episode today, but here's what happened. So, this is one of those magic years where it's an especially short gap between Thanksgiving and Christmas, and I put out the last regular archive episode on Thanksgiving Day. I had a Ben's junk I wanted to get out the door, I wanted to get today's video out the door before Christmas, and I'm hoping to get together a little archive riffs thing for Boxing Day this year, day after Christmas. So in the name of keeping the dates in order, I just added an extra week between standard archive episodes for this first half of the month. Anyway, it's thrifting day today, and I've got a lot of footage to get through. So with that, let's take a look at this year's Upper Midwestern Yuletide Offerings. Yes, I really was at Benson's Flea Market at the W.H. Lyon Fairgrounds in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. But they're not too big on signage, so here's a Budweiser sign that appears to be urinating rust. Now, I shot this just after Halloween, and it still seems to be a little aesthetically closer to Halloween. And they want 75 bucks for bondage albino claws there. And I really honestly couldn't tell if this Santa is supposed to be winking at me, or if he's just that decrepit. And no, the farmer in the overalls and camouflage was not for sale. In this box of DVD and VHS, I found a still-boxed copy of Xenophobe for the NES at $80. I'd never heard of this game, no idea if it's good or not, but I refuse to pay 80 bucks for any NES game. Speaking of NES, I found a whole box of loose cartridges, including a few unofficial, unlicensed titles. You know, the ones that you usually had to do some kind of rain dance to make them work on your console. I don't really collect those, but cool to see. Now, I also found a copy of the Double Dare NES game, and if there ever was a game show that doesn't translate to home game status, I think it's that one. Otherwise, it's kind of looking like half classics and half angry video game nerds' greatest hits. And there's another unlicensed game. And uh, seriously, what's so special about a blackjack game that makes a loose cartridge worth 40 bucks? The whole box was way overpriced. At the same booth, I found a box of loose Super Nintendo games. Again, mostly overpriced. Yeah, never knew there was an SNES version of SimCity. Now, I also found a copy of Super Mario World, which a couple of years ago I would have coughed up the 15 bucks for, but I bought an SNES Mini last year, so not really a concern anymore. And I never knew Doom was on SNES. I played the PC version at a friend's house a few times growing up, though. I came stupidly close to buying this Sega Master System. 50 bucks for a complete console is not too bad a price these days. But honestly, I just couldn't justify it. Now, the guy running the booth said they'd be back in January, so I'll see how I feel about it by then. Real classy. Switch to laughs and turn on your friends. Flash it. <laughs> Whatever. Portable x-ray unit. Gender box not checked. And uh, I'm guessing it's the men's model. Well, some men. Pet horny toad. <laughs> but why would I? Now, on a less rednecky note, they had a couple of those old Mattel handheld sports games. And for all I know, 10 bucks is a good price, but... I don't collect these things. Found a bunch of period garbage pail kids bubblegum cards. 
And these are original. Uh, the green ones there that I'm about to pick up are from 1986. And I bet you the gum is sawdust by now. And no, I wasn't interested enough to, you know, confirm that. Beneath this NWO wrestling announcer mic was something interesting. <laughs> yeah, I'm not into wrestling. But anyway, uh, I found this thing called Body Wrap from about 1989. And from the look of it, you strap a bunch of button sensors to your arms and legs and become some kind of human beatbox. I embarrass myself enough on Archive. I don't need to do anything like that. But, uh, man, this is truly the bottom of the late 80s, early 90s barrel. Found a box filled with Little Blue Books, which started as an ideologically motivated series of cheap pocket-sized books, but after a few years mostly became more general reading, a cheap, accessible way to acquire a little culture. And after looking the numbers up, these particular ones all seem to date to the latter half of the 1920s. And uh, no, the Limericks one was not dirty. And yes, I picked out a few of the books. Always gotta go through the records. This particular lot was way overpriced for the condition of the discs themselves. Uh, don't let those sleeves fool you. And uh, really, there wasn't anything too special anyway. We've got one of the U.S. versions of one of the Beatles albums. Otherwise, there was a copy of Three Dog Nights Hard Labor, an album that if I ever find an LP without the Band-Aid, I'm snagging it. Good album, too. And I'd take the war one on CD. And this lot was looking kind of dull until I found this one from Mike Warnke. And it's one of those woefully unfunny Murr Records, alleged comedy records, but Mike Warnke was outed years later for making up stories about his supposedly satanic past. Now, I've seen this Fonzie one a few times, never picked it up because, save for I think one song, it's just an oldies compilation. And uh, there was an October 30th tradition in archive land, been a tradition of mine since I was a teenager. Otherwise, uh, a whole lot of soft rock, and uh, nothing wrong with that. Of course, you gotta have loads of country music. Now, this one caught my eye. Live Rocky Mountain Oysters. That actually looks kind of amusing. And as it turned out, it's local. And I'd like to eventually do a local flavor episode. And at one dollar, yeah, I'll give it a shot. Patriotic stuff. More country. Now, this looked interesting. Uncle Bud's Hospital Experience. I just about picked it up until I read the back cover. Yeah, it's religious. And it looks like Uncle Bud wrote several autobiographies, one of which was posthumously published. I seriously doubt he's that interesting. More country stuff, of course. Lots of that around here. Ooh, Polka! Mixing it up there. Oh, now there's a flashback. I touched on this on the CB radio episode, and Shirley and Squirrely also appeared on one of my Christmas episodes. Now, this album was released by Radio Shack via their realistic name, and I've actually never run into a copy of this one. And once again, one dollar in excellent condition, so yeah, I'll take it. And more country. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm fine with guys like Chet Atkins, but uh, oh geez. Easily one of the most infamous records covered on record ripoffs. I'll leave that for some other poor wretched soul. Hello, I'm Not Johnny Cash by Sherwin Linton recorded at the South Dakota State Penitentiary. Now, I almost picked this one up until I realized that it's A, another religious record, and B, is not actually local, like I thought. He's based out of Minneapolis. By that measure, Prince would qualify for local flavor. And uh, by the way, Sherwin is still active. Still more country. Oh, and it looks like Wade's looking up her nightgown, doesn't it? And, uh, yeah, you guessed it. 
another religious album. I totally would have come in to ask about this huggable holiday offer from Coca-Cola, but I was already in, and nobody knew what the hell I was talking about anyway. But aside from that, I think I'm ready to go to the drive-in movie. I've got my bug deflector, and actually I think a lot of this stuff may have come from an old drive-in. Alas, they didn't have any pick anti-mosquito coils. A pleasant aroma for you, but not for mosquitoes. And I found a store ad for a free paddle ball with each carton of Dr. Pepper, and there's no expiration date, so theoretically. And, well, it gets a bit humid around here, but if I want to put heat in my gas tank, I think I'll buy a fresh bottle. Yes, it was still full. Oh, right, almost forgot that this was supposed to be a Christmas episode. Apparently the thing for 1986 was for unsettling Santa Claus and sleeping kid paintings. Apparently 1991 was all about harassing postal workers. (laughs) I tell you, I missed all the good stuff. Now, I had one of these, I think, Hallmark beanbag reindeer growing up. I remember there was a character name, but I've long forgotten it. Uh, Something tells me I could make the world's most warped nativity scene out of all these figures. Well, this is a new one on me. Some 1989-ish Super Mario Christmas cards. But I don't do Christmas cards. Humbug. Well, if I've done my sleuthing correctly, these Noma Christmas tree lights are from sometime in the 1955 to 58 range. A little disorganized in there. Now, I like my vintage stuff, but I draw the line at putting 60-plus-year-old lights on my tree. And I think these Paramount lights are even older. I'd guess mid-30s to mid-40s and nice tissue paper in there. And I'd guess that these Italian lanterns are somewhat more recent. And there was a whole nother stack of Noma lights, some of which I think go as far back as the 30s. Cool, but kind of terrifying. Oh yeah, and gotta have the redneck liquor lights. And the haul from the flea market consists of the Radio Shack CB Radio Cashin LP, All Ears, from 1977. Then I found a few record ripoffs candidates off camera, a couple of country crossover discs, and I also found one of those Pickwick, not the original soundtrack, soundtrack type deals. That one's for Grease. Then we've got the Rocky Mountain Oysters live album. And we've got three little blue books, a book of Broadway wisecracks, the best jokes about drunks, and, of course, a book of humorous limericks. This stupid book forced me to learn how to pronounce anthropophagus. And on to my most regular goodwill. And once again, I'm parked too far away to get a decent shot of the logo, so I guess the exit sign will have to do. Again. I hit something of a small jackpot of local releases in the CDs. This is Shelley Bessler with Are You Aware of This? I am now. Something tells me this is going to be a bad singer-songwriter album, which is fine because I don't find too many of those. Now this all-public-domain Christmas album turned out to be not quite local. It's from Omaha, Nebraska, so I passed. Something tells me it's just a boring piano or classical vocal album anyway. Now, I found an EP from a group called Lunar Funk Theory, and that's a bad jam band name if I ever heard one. And as you'll see in just a bit here, the disc was pretty beaten up, but I think I can get it to play. Yeah. Now, I wasn't sure if this band was local at first, but there are some local references in the notes And uh, only the real douchebags call Sioux Falls Sufu. And yes, a quick online search confirmed that they were local. Managed to look right past another Lunar Funk Theory release, which is okay because I think I found something better. Get out those old records, 
by Ray Larson. Now, I initially thought this was just a mixtape, but it appears to be Ray's ridiculously low-budget album, complete with unmarked CDR. In the records, it's Nordic Day at Goodwill. We've got Scandinavian American folk dance music from Minnesota. And on an unrelated note, we've got Christmas with the Chuck Wagon Gang, which appears to not be about dog food. And of course, the usual religious stuff, the usual country stuff, and uh, of course, every now and then, the Twain Meat. Now, I'm always tempted to pick up these religious albums with the awkward family photo album covers, but the few I've picked up have always been really dull to listen to. Now, I managed to misread this one as Rap Turd, <laughs> stupid 70s fonts, and this seems to come from that awkward transition between young teen idol Pat Boone and lifelong senior citizen Pat Boone. And, uh, hey, I mentioned it was Nordic Day at Goodwill. Now, I almost picked up this one. Swing Along with Santa's Snowman. But once again, once I looked over the back cover, uh, well, I'd be willing to bet heavily that it's just another lame kitty chorus album. That and the record was totally trashed. Amongst the easy listening, it's The Revenge of Stan and Doug. I covered their Christmas album last year, and... They're not terribly funny, but they're endearing. I guess it's my duty to pick this one up, isn't it? I did a Ben's Junk on the original Star Shower a couple years ago, and it looks like they've advanced to both Christmas and Halloween colors and patterns since then. Eight bucks was too much, though. I mean, they were, what, like 15 new? found a couple of CD players, this Optimus former all-in-one box component deal, and the Sony unit isn't too far off from mine, but my CD player is good right now, so knock on wood. In the decorations, I found a Santa Claus that's apparently just been to the eye doctor. I found a novelty I Believe in Santa Claus hat, complete with forced nightcap, and some candle holder with an indiscernible design. Found a couple of tacky piggy banks from 2012 from Old Navy. Didn't know they ever sold such things. Now, this red one just looks like it ought to have a cute cartoon apple sticking out of its mouth. Tacky, but not tacky enough for Archive. Now, I found this interesting. A Santa Claus figure named Mr. Christmas. I didn't know there were any copyright issues with Santa Claus. Or they were just trying to be different and failed. Oh, lovely. The water in the snow globe has turned brown. And the haul from this store consists of a sealed Video 8 camcorder tape for the supply box. Now, all but one of the CDs I picked up were local. This one from the Trench Coats, seemingly an a cappella group, was just too weird looking to pass up. I just had to hear their tribute to Vanilla Ice. We got the Shelley Bessler album, we got the hopefully Ray Larson album, and we got the Lunar Funk Theory EP. And out of a demented sense of duty, yes, I picked up the Stan and Doug album. And on to today's last store, Savers. They claim to have the biggest and most unique Christmas section. Let's see how true that is. But first, gotta hit the electronics. Now, I'd never seen an 8-track deck like this before. This is a Roadmaster portable unit, complete with built-in speakers and a cigarette lighter adapter. And it looks like it had drained your car battery in a heartbeat. Still, this is a 100% new one on me. And I haven't been able to find much about these things online, so it's truly unique. Ladies and gentlemen, I have located the briefcase belonging to the underachiever great, times ten, grandnephew of George Frederick Handel, Donald Handel. Is there any great sheet music in there? Any lost classics? Nope. 
Just an ancient silica gel packet. Boy, I'm just finding older than usual stuff today. I found this terrifying looking iron, guaranteed to knock out any wet bandits cold. Then I found, a, underneath that bale of decorative hay, a still inbox Smith Corona electronic adding machine at $7, and it looks to be in amazing condition. Now, I don't collect this sort of stuff, but this ought to make some calculator collector's day. Another ancient find, and man, this thing must be 70 years old, if it were actually there. Well, uh, there's the packing slip. Maybe that'll give us a clue. October 9th, 9th—smudge. So much for solving that mystery. Found one of those old home tutorial package system things, this one for golf, sold at Spiegel's, initially for $39 and marked down to $9.97. And uh, yes, it is complete, and <laughs> if I can ever open it, because, you know, only one hand, I'll show you what's in there. It's got whatever this odd plastic ball and styrofoam device is. And of course, you gotta have the VHS tape, so... Let's see what Wally Armstrong can teach me. Apparently not much, given the tiny amount of tape on that reel. But, uh, hey, we got a timecode list to look for specific points in the video. I don't think it would make a good VHS vault. Okay, getting to the Christmas stuff. This store proved to be a treasure trove of proportionally impossible Santa Clauses. And I especially liked this one because he's got the tiniest, flattest head I have ever seen. Seriously, it looks like it got caved in with a rock. And then we've got the Jack Skellington physique model. And, uh, boy, <laughs> this one had some heft to it. I mean, it's like a festive billy club. Oh, Lord, I remember the shoebox line of stuff back in the 90s. Don't remember anyone ever buying any of the merchandise, and this mint condition ornament and box tells me no one ever hung the ornaments. Oh, please don't tell me that's an urn with someone's ashes in it. There's only one way to find out. Please don't let old Aunt June be in here. Oh, hallelujah. Hey, I wouldn't put it past some folks. And the winner of the Creepy Christmas Decorations Sweepstakes is this borderline drag queen Santa with a peg nose for three bucks. Oh man, forget the billy club Santa. This is pure heavy timber. I guess if I wanted to be a festive terrorist, I could throw it through someone's window. Good lord, even this is too creepy for me. There's your Yuletide nightmare fuel. Okay, I admit, it's not my biggest or most memorable haul, but nonetheless, I managed to pick up six LPs, I got the Stan and Doug album, I seem to be on my way to unintentionally collecting their entire discography, we've got the Rocky Mountain Oysters live album, we have got the Radio Shack slash Realistic All Ears CB Radio Cash-In LP, we've got three record ripoffs candidates, two country crossover discs, both from the latter half of the 60s. And then we have got the Pickwick Not Original Soundtrack soundtrack album for Greece. Then we've got four CDs, all but one of which are for the local flavor candidate pile, the one non-local one featuring a tribute to Vanilla Ice, a cappella no less, then we've got a sealed Video 8 camcorder tape to go in my stash of blank media. And lastly, three little blue books, all seemingly dating to the late 1920s. And the cost of this haul came out to about $16. And that's it for today. Next week is this year's Christmas special. I'll see you then.
All right, let me pick out some random limericks here. Uh, let's try this one. There once was an old lady of Worcester who was often annoyed by a rooster. She cut off his head until he was dead, and now he don't crow like he used to. Hilarious. Let's try another one. There once were some learned MDs who captured some germs of disease and infected a train which, without causing pain, allowed one to catch it with ease. Ay, ay, ay. Alright, stop! Collaborate and listen! Ice is back with his brand new invention!